Good morning, and thank you for joining us for our online service today. Endurance Church of the Valley is a Bible-based church that seeks to glorify God through the fulfillment of the Great Commission by reaching, connecting, training, and sending God's people into the world. Join us at ECB for corporate prayer and study every Wednesday at 5 a.m. right here at the church. Please be assured that proper social distancing is practiced during the pandemic as we gather for prayer each Wednesday morning. Join ECV for church-wide fasting and prayer every Tuesday from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. A detailed email was sent out with specifics. As a church, we will be praying for the various needs that have arisen in our communities and our nation as a result of the coronavirus pandemic. If you'd like more information, please email us at info at endurancechurch.com. On Saturday, June 6th from 9 to 10 a.m., the ECV Men of Endurance will be holding a Zoom meeting check-in. It will be a time for the Men of Endurance and friends to connect, communicate, and pray together. All men are welcome. A flock note with the Zoom link will be sent out soon, so keep an eye out for it. Join us on Thursdays for our midweek online training series via Facebook. In our current series, Pastor Will unpacks the question, what is the gospel? Links will be available on both Facebook and Flocknote. Today is Communion Sunday. Celebrate with us today after Pastor Will's message by having your elements ready so that together we can partake as members of the body of Christ. ECV is taking prayer requests. If you need prayer, either for yourself or someone else, you can always email us at info at endurancechurch.com. Offerings to the church can be made by texting 481-2055-2715-803-4772. You can also go to endurancechurch.com and click on the Give link at the top of the page. We are very glad you've chosen to worship with us this morning. We hope you will enjoy the rest of the service today. Now, here's Pastor Will Sullivan with today's message. Good morning, Endurance Church of the Valley. Let's turn in our Bibles to Philippians chapter 1. And I'm going to start here from verse 12, um, but we're going to read all the way through verse 26. But I'll be expounding upon verses 25 and 26 today. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Verse 25. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. So that in me, you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. My wife 
did not marry a handyman. These hands do damage to a home. Especially when it comes down to mounting things in my home. I can remember a time in our leadership meeting that I was talking to some of our leaders and I had made the comment that I was calling upon a handyman to mount the TVs in my home and I got rebuked. Um, my, my manhood was questioned because I had called upon a handyman to mount my TVs. And I told them, I said, look here, you got to know your strengths and your weaknesses. You got to know when to stay in your lane. And the last thing that I want to be thinking about is if this TV is going to fall on anyone. But no matter what my leader said, I got my TVs mounted. Now, this was really the first time I'd ever gotten my TVs mounted. And as the handyman and his crew came into the house, he, he says, look, he says, if I mount this TV and the other TVs around the house, he says, I want you to understand, he says, there is no looking back. There, I'm going to be screwing deep into the wall. And so if you were ever to change it, it would actually cause damage to your wall. Well, I looked this man in the eye, not even a year ago. <laughs> and I told him, no, put it up. We're not changing anything. Well, about a month ago, my wife and I decided to change the look of our living room. We've got a rectangular sized living room or rectangular shaped living room. And so I was convincing my wife that the TV would look much better here on the long part of the wall. But I remembered what the handyman said. He says, look, there is no looking back. That once we screw this in, once we nail this into the wall, yes, you can move your TV, but those mounts will cause damage to the wall. Well, I called another handyman and he came over, and sure enough, if you come over our home right now, there's four huge holes in our wall, and there's paint missing. And I kept going back and remembering what the handyman said. He said that we're going to screw in deep, and these are going to be tightly fastened to the wall. This isn't meant for you to keep pulling out and changing the location of your TV because it'll damage your wall. Like Paul, like our calling in Christ, if we as believers in Christ remove ourselves from the commitment of our calling, we can damage the progress of the church and our families because we choose our convenience over our calling. This is why, like Paul, we must persevere. And if you're going to remember anything today, we must persevere and nail our life to the commitment of our calling to the glory of God. Today, we begin part seven of our sermon series, Perspective. And the title of today's message is a challenge for us today. Are you committed to your calling? Let us pray. Father, I pray that you would use me today in a very inspirational way. Open our eyes to our calling, almighty God. I pray that men and women, Lord, are inspired this day by your words to courageously live out their calling unto you. So, Father, we thank you, we love you, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. 
Uh, we find um, in the scriptures here in Philippians 1, an imprisoned Paul who is confidently hopeful that in view of his upcoming trial with full courage that Jesus will be exalted in every way. We know Paul's imprisonment has advanced the gospel in new places in Rome, but his return to the church in Philippi would advance the gospel further into the faith of the church as a testimony unto the delivering power and hands of God. Like Paul, we must realize there is no progress in the church without courage to live out our calling. I hope we're starting to pick this up now as we've gotten to part seven. That Paul has an amazing way of viewing his ups and downs with a calm demeanor that is rooted in the faith of Christ Jesus we learned last week Paul's purpose statement, which truly should be the purpose statement for every disciple in Christ is for me to live and to die is gain. From Paul's point of view, if we were to aim for Christ in all that we do, it's a win-win situation. But as believers, we must die to self so others will live to magnify our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. See, Paul understood that our lives are a gift to others in the blessed hands of our God. What we are witnessing in the scriptures is that Paul chose his calling over his comfort. See, like Paul, we should be locked into our calling every single moment of the day. But what we find here in verses 25 and 26 is we find Paul's assignment and Paul's aim, which were very clear. See, his calling never took a back seat to his discomforts. He didn't pick and choose or select when he was going to live out his calling. It was every day, all day. As Christians, there's something to learn here in regards to the assignment. See, our main assignment is to bind ourselves to the building up of others. Look at what Paul says here in verse 25. Convinced of this. Now remember that convinced of this. We got to look and say, well, what does he mean by this? Well, if we go back into the scriptures, what we see is in verse 24. But to remain in the flesh, basically to remain alive, to remain here on this earth is more necessary on your account. So Paul says, convinced of this, I know I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. Paul says he is convinced that he will remain and continue for the spiritual growth of the Philippian church. See, his inner conflict of living or dying is now resolved in Christ Jesus. He believes that by the grace of God, his presence will have a positive impact on the church. But let's take a moment here and understand what's really going on. See, like Paul, it is our responsibility to take inventory of our influence. Come on, church. Look around you. Look around. Take ownership of the effect that you have on others. You know what Paul is doing? Paul is on purpose with his presence. He is spiritually aware. There is discernment 
in his life. He's looking at how it is that his presence impacts the progress of others. It reminds me of a situation in where this past year, myself and uh, Josh Honeycutt, one of our elders, and Donovan Henley, one of our deacons, and Tim Arthur, we had traveled to Dallas uh, for this uh, tremendous church conference. But I needed to get back a little earlier. I thought I could change my flight, but there were certain restrictions upon the ticket that was purchased. But that ticket for me to get home to watch my daughter play soccer at the Croc Center, the Salvation Army down the street, that ticket was going to cost me about $500 just to get back home early enough to watch my child play soccer. And you know what I did? I bought that ticket. And I bought that ticket because I understood the impact and the influence of my wife and I upon our children. She didn't know what I went through to get to that soccer game that night. But the presence of my wife and I was an encouragement to her atmosphere of adversity. Like any child, she felt that her mom and I provided something that impacted her success. But what she didn't know on the other side is that her parents were just relishing in the moment of watching her progress. Take ownership, like Paul, of the effect that you have on the faith of others. See, those words remaining and continuing, it signifies that we are called into community. And like any community, someone is counting on you to play your role and live out your calling in Christ. And the manner in which we live out our calling is truly by leaning into community. That's what Christ did. That's what Paul did. And that's what, as disciples of Christ, we are to do. We are to lean into community, especially in our trials. When we face adversity, this becomes a great opportunity for those in whom you are influencing in your life. You are on trial. Your faith is on trial. They want to see the Jesus in you. You have an opportunity in your adversity to choose ministry over your misery. Ministry over your misery. Every Wednesday morning, we come here at 5 a.m. to intercede for others. And I remember one of our members, Vanessa, she put someone on the board and his name was Papa Joe. But the testimony that she shared with Papa Joe, it influenced me in a very mighty way. It inspired me in a mighty way. And she talked about how Papa Joe was always encouraging, always looking to lean into community and live out his calling as an evangelist. She talked about him as he was the Pied Piper of children. Children loved him. People loved Papa Joe. But as he got older, Papa Joe got sick and he was now in assisted living. And now as he was in assisted living, slowly dying. He chose ministry over his misery. 
He continued to evangelize. He continued to pray for people. He continued to encourage others because he shifted his focus from his misery to serving others by way of the calling that God had on his life. See, your adversity is the opportunity to make the conscious choice to exalt Christ and choose ministry over your misery. Author Henry James is quoted as saying, the best use of your life is to invest in something or someone that will outlast you. Live out your calling by leaning into community. Paul says he will remain and continue with them all for their progress and joy in the faith. The church, you know what he's saying? I am devoted to discipleship. I am devoted to purposely pour the gospel into others. Now church, what he didn't say was that I'm remaining and continuing to further your career. He didn't say I'm remaining and continuing to help you experience joy in what the world offers. No, 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 no. See, church, as disciples of Christ, we mean business. Anybody, anybody, go to any kind of guru that you want to in your career field, and I guarantee they'll give you some great things about your career. But the church, our job is to exalt Christ and to pour out into everyone the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. See, this is about their spiritual Growth. This is about nothing else but helping the church to experience the joy of knowing and believing in Jesus Christ. Romans 15, 13 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. I'm going to say that again. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. So that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. See, joy and peace come from our trust in God. So by the power of the Holy Spirit, we will abound in hope through Christ. Church, I, I implore you, make the conscious choice to focus on the faith of others and you do that by dying to self and surrendering to the leading of the Holy Spirit so others would experience the blessed joy of living for Christ let me take a moment here this is the part where Sakari would typically say, here he goes. He's getting ready to go in. Paul is teaching today's church leaders, parents, and couples to live out their calling. See, the words here in the Greek of remaining and continuing for the progress indicates close fellowship, meaning you are walking alongside a person. And we should do so as an example of perseverance and passion for the greater glory of Christ. In and out of our trials. What is Paul saying? You, if you're going to talk it, you've got to walk it. You're going to talk about Christ. Your walk needs to display that. 
church leaders. It is a painful error to neglect your calling every time you feel inconvenienced. We got to stay on the post. Husbands, it's a painful error to neglect your calling as a husband when you feel inconvenienced. Single moms, it's a painful error to neglect your calling as a mom every time you feel inconvenienced. Because then we develop the attitude of attempting to living out our calling when we feel like it. A true calling isn't convenient. It's transformative. It shapes you. See, your calling isn't something that you fit into the schedule of your life. Your life stands, stands upon the commitment to your calling in Christ. See, underneath all this is Paul's confidence in understanding his calling in Christ. See, this wasn't about him. This was about what God is doing through him and will do through him him. Let's turn to Romans chapter 15, verse 15 through 20. I want you just to hear the, the passion behind Paul and his calling. Romans chapter 15, verses 15 through 20. But on some points I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace given me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God, so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In Christ Jesus, that I have reason to be proud of my work for God. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. And thus, I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. Did you hear his passion? Did you hear how he is nailed to the commitment of his calling? Nothing, and I repeat, nothing is more important than living out our calling because nothing is more important than doing what God has created you to do. Because if our purpose is to glorify God forever, then our calling, for those who get this confused, then our calling is the unique way he has equipped you by his spirit to accomplish his will anywhere that you go. The Bible says his gifts and calling are irrevocable. Can I say this and share this with you today in love? Quit waiting for your arrival. Quit waiting for you to arrive and start living out your calling where you are at. One small faithful step at a time. And let God bring forth the fruitful increase. A lot of us in regards to our calling, that's what we're like, we're waiting around. 
We're waiting around when God has already been pressing upon your heart. The gifts that you are to use is you would lean into community and nail your life to the commitment of your call. It's like those men, and I'm sorry if I offend you, but those men or those women who would say that I need this much money to get married. That I've got to have 10,000, 15,000, 20,000. I got to have all this money before I propose because I want to give her a huge rock and I want to have a big time wedding. Well, let me share something with you. I'm going on 17 years of marriage and my wife and I got married by the justice of the peace. We didn't want to wait. See, the key in regards to living at our calling is just be faithful. Just be faithful to what God has given you by his grace. As disciples of Christ, we must be prepared at all times to deny ourselves by renouncing anything that would hinder our ability to fulfill our calling. Because the impact of your calling is connected to your willingness to sacrifice for the greatness of others unto the glory of Christ Jesus. Well, let me bring this together because I believe it's something that the church may have forgotten about. According to Matthew 20, 28, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So by grace, Christ Jesus, our King, served his creation. He entered human history for our sin required a debt to be paid and it was paid in full with the blood of Jesus Christ. It is only because of the perfect Lamb of God that we are justified so that as sinners we would be viewed in God's eyes as if we had never sinned. He gave his life as a ransom for many. Jesus came to serve church. Jesus made a conscious choice to bind himself to the building up of his church. His calling came at a great cost. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're watching this, can you live for others? Can you? Can you sacrifice or lower yourself for the benefit of others? Can you demonstrate that you want the best for others even at your own expense? Because Jesus' standard for our calling is humility. Humility. Not your status, not your power, not your authority. Humility. Because humility implies Christ centeredness while being others focused, while the sin of pride signifies self centeredness while being me focused. Can I be honest with you, church? This is why, personally, I don't want the church, ECV, and the body of Christ to go back to what it was. To go back to what it was. The church as a whole, and I am part of it, has become so me-focused that we have forgotten that Jesus came to serve and not to be served. See, the church now has developed a Burger King mentality. We want to have church our way. So it's no wonder why people are transferring from church to church because... If your church isn't customized to the convenience of others, then they'll just go somewhere else. 
But did we forget that customizing to please people is what businesses do, not churches? Can I remind you that the body of Christ is the bride of Christ, not a prostitute? The bride of Christ does not stand on the corner and wear something revealing to attract people. The bride is beautiful. The bride is beautiful. There's no need to cheapen it. Cheapen the value. Seeker-friendly Churches lead to spoiled Christians. And spoiled Christians, like spoiled children, leave churches without talking to anyone when they don't get what they're looking for in a church. They go somewhere to someone who is married to their Burger King mentality. I'm so sorry. Because in the body of Christ, a lot of this is perpetuated through our teen ministries. Let's customize church. And when they come out of their customization, they're looking for another customization to how they want church to be. Burger King mentality. I don't want the church to go back to the way it was. But let's be clear. We are to reach the lost. We are, as Paul says, to become all things to all people. That by all means, some might be saved. But that doesn't mean we compromise our calling. We are called to be people focused through Christ, not people pleasers. Because we are to fear God, not man. Galatians 1.10 in the New Living Translation says it greatly. Obviously, I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but of God. If, if pleasing people were my goal, I would not be Christ's servant. Nail your life to the commitment of your calling. Bind yourself to the building up of others. Find someone to disciple. And if you're not being discipled, someone who is walking with you and pouring their life and the gospel into you, find someone. Don't let anything get in the way of your calling. But like the Apostle Paul, we got to think big picture. See, our assignment like Paul's has an aim. The aim is the greater purpose of advancing the gospel to the glory of God. Verse 26, he says, So that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Paul is literally saying his release will give the church more than enough reason to boast in the power of Christ Jesus with overflowing joy. Similar to Philippians 4.10 where the financial donation of the church in Philippi brought joy and praise to the Lord, Paul's presence provides an opportunity for worship and praise unto our Lord. For though Paul's release, ladies and gentlemen, is the cause for joy, the joy is directed to the object of their worship, Jesus Christ. Jesus stands above every demon, every devil, and every weapon formed against us. But we must persevere and nail our lives to the commitment of our call to the glory of God. I end as I began. Are you committed 
to your calling. Let us pray. Father, I thank you um, for the power of your spirit. I thank you for the demonstration, God, of truth being expounded upon. I pray, God, that as this message, Lord, challenges us all, Father, even myself, Lord, I repent of any moments, O oh Lord, in which I have overlooked my, my call for my own convenience, O oh Lord. I repent, O oh God, of moments as a father, as a husband, O oh Lord, that I was idle, Lord, in my approach and attitude. Lord, change me, O oh God. I thank you, Lord, that these messages, O oh Lord, are for us all. And so I pray this day, God, for the individuals in whom you are calling into a personal life changing relationship with you. I pray this day, O oh God, that they would commit themselves unto you this day, O oh Lord, as they would confess their sin, as they would repent, O oh Lord, as you would change their mind and as they would focus, Lord, upon trusting in you, that you would pour out your spirit as they would call out to you and their lives would be forever changed. Lord, in this time of transition in the church, help those, God, who are at home watching online to connect to the local body of Christ. And I pray, God, for budding ministers, O oh Lord. I pray for those who are struggling right now because you are calling them to a deeper, intimate relationship with you to live out their calling with courage. Help them, O oh Lord, that they would not imagine an expectation that you did not plant in their minds and in their hearts. I pray they trust in you and that wherever they are at, that they would live out their calling one small step of faith at a time. So Father, we thank you, we love you, and in Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Today is Communion Sunday. As believers in Christ, we're instructed to observe the Lord's Supper as a memorial of Jesus' suffering and death on the cross for human sin and a declaration of the power of the cross until the Lord returns in all his glory. The Lord's Supper is symbolic of the redemptive act of God through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ as the Passover lamb. I would suggest at this moment, if you haven't already, to retrieve and prepare your communion elements of the bread or crackers and juice so you are able to participate in the Lord's Supper. I urge you to pause before you partake to remind yourselves that Jesus Christ is present with us at all times in a wondrous and unexplainable way. Praise him for strengthening you and drawing you closer to him to be blessed with the outpouring of his grace for you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Before we pray, let us be mindful that if you are unreconciled with Jesus, you are under no obligation to partake of communion. As a believer in Christ, if you are harboring unforgiveness in your heart, I urge you to repent and make peace as long as it depends upon you before you partake. As parents, feel free to allow your children to receive the communion elements if you know they've repented and received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and understand the Lord's Supper. Let us pray. Father, we ask, Lord, at this time that you would search our hearts and that, God, if you would find anything within us, O oh Lord, that would be unreconciled, Lord, we know that you would bring forth the instruction you would bring forth the courage and the love for us to grow in grace in this moment. Help us, Lord, in this moment to not desecrate this moment by simply marking it as tradition. Help us, Lord, to understand that this is a spiritual activity, Lord, that is only permissible by your grace. So, Father, we thank you, we love you, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11:23, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, 
This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us partake of the bread. Continuing in verse 25, Paul says in the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us partake. Praise God. Thank you again for joining us online for ECV Sunday service. And we are overjoyed that you would partake with us virtually, communion with us this day. I pray you have a blessed week and God bless. We hope you enjoyed today's message. To stream more of our past video sermons, please check out our YouTube channel or our website at endurancechurch.com. You can also learn more about our church, our various ministries, and how you can get involved. Again, our website is endurancechurch.com. We'd love to hear from you. Drop us a line anytime at info at God bless you, and thanks for being part of our online service today.